uh, simulation exercise negotiating the Rio Declaration. And we thought of, uh, since uh, the discussion on the meeting in Rio next year is uh, important, uh, and we thought of uh, doing the exercise. We are waiting for Vlada to join us in a few minutes with instructions how to do, the, how to do exercise and what are the different roles. Well, we should have uh, offered some coffee because it's really early morning. Uh, and I know that Salah is morning person. I don't know about others. Good. Oh, this is transcribed. Oh my God, I have to be careful. <laughs> Well, uh, the exercise is based on DIPLO's methodology of conducting simulation exercises and providing training in chairing meetings. And uh, basically, it is done through the roles played by uh, people involved and um, um, uh, engagement and supervision by experts who will be involved in the exercise. And now you will see in a few minutes when Vlad arrives with papers how it is organized. You will play the roles of the main uh, actors in uh, drafting committee. Therefore, this is a morning, uh, we can imagine mid-May uh, mid 2014 in Rio, after a lovely reception that you had yesterday and uh, you ha had a chance to liaison with other delegates and to sort out the last uh, questions about the final draft which should be adopted today in one hour time by presidents, prime ministers, CEOs, and other prominent players in the negotiation exercise, in the, in the Rio meeting. Then we will have about 45 minutes to finalize the drafting and to discuss the last elements of the Rio declaration. But it seems, and it's sometimes part of the negotiation, that the logistical issues, uh, somebody has an interest to delay the start of the session, you know. And Vlada is, we're still waiting for him. Do you have any question while the secretariat is, is trying to prepare papers, comments? We have distinguished delegate of uh, Fiji. No, you cannot. Well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering whether the delegation from Nigeria has arrived. <laughs> Thank you, Fiji, for assisting the chair in the managing the protocol aspect of the exercise.
else. I can see that our negotiation already attracted a lot of attention. We have some of the most experienced negotiators in internet governance arriving. Jan Peter, good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, once again. If any one of you sitting in the back rows is interested to join us for this session, we need you because we can't start with people that are not sitting here. So please come and join us uh, around this table. Thank you. Okay, since we have more chiefs than, than Indians uh, today, we have uh, mainly experts around the table and a uh, few participants who would like to participate in the, in the orientation session. Let us uh, slightly change the focus of the, this session and instead of simulation exercise that we planned, what we will discuss uh, international negotiation, main processes international negotiations and the uh, role of the chair. And uh, as you know, the, any negotiating process has a few phases. The first one is a decision shaping uh, phase where the main issues are identified. And to the large extent, Internet Governance Forum is part of the decision shaping process. The issues are uh, identified, discussed, and uh, as you know, negotiation is not conducted in the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, when it comes to the negotiation, uh, it has to be uh, strictly organized, there are uh, procedural rules, mainly based on the British parliamentarian tradition, and then uh, adopted and codified by the United Nations. You have the UN Rules of Procedure, which specifies everything from the roles of the chair, um, procedural motions, uh, making point of orders, drafting process, voting, and other details. 
And uh, when we were preparing for today's exercise, we thought of organizing simulation around the question of the negotiation which we will have next year in Rio at the, whatever is called the summit of conference or event uh, in Rio, uh, following the latest initiative by uh, Brazil and ICANN. And that was the general context for the simulation exercise. We prepared some sort of imaginary roles of the main players, including um, uh, United States, uh, European Union, China, business sector, civil society, Brazil, and G G77, and ICANN. And you will have a chance to consult it and to see how realistic it is. It is a simulation exercise, therefore it doesn't necessarily reflect the reality, but we try to do to, to make some sort of approximation. Uh, the negotiation exercise for the Rio Declaration is divided in three baskets. The first basket is on institutional framework. What is the institutional framework for the future internet governance? Question of data protection and question of human rights. And as you will see from these instructions, the various actors have different uh, roles in the simulation exercise. For example, when it comes to institutional framework, some players are more interested in multi-stakeholder uh, process, status quo. Then you have a group of the players who are keen to have enhanced multi-stakeholderism. And when you move towards the other side of this uh, range of positions, you have intergovernmental uh, players who are interested in pure intergovernmental process whether built around the ITU or the new international organization on the internet. Therefore, it is quite imaginary uh, a set of the position and, uh, and roles. And uh, the second basket is on data protection. Obviously, it is a highly important issue nowadays, and uh, the question is how to ensure data protection on the global scale. Uh, is it enough just to have the stronger enforcement mechanisms for the existing uh, uh, international convention, uh, would the better way be to have the, some sort of self-regulation by business sector followed by enfor enforcement and implementation mechanisms by uh, some public authorities. And the last basket is about uh, human rights, uh, divided around three sets of human rights of direct relevance for the internet, freedom of expression and uh, free flow of information, uh, protection of privacy, and the right of access and uh, some sort of socio-economic uh, set of uh, human rights. This was the general exercise and what, what would be useful and Vlada can moderate uh, this part of the session. I will, uh, will distribute the uh, set of roles and uh, uh, you can later on the discuss and we may develop the exercise which could help in uh, not only in, uh, in uh, diplomatic training but also in, uh, in discussing uh, later on substantive, substantive issues. Now, you will also receive the document of the position of the chairperson, which outlined the main procedural and substantive functions of the chairperson. What is the role of the chairperson? What are the main instruments for chairperson that he or she can use? And you can see the controversy starts even with the title. Is it a chairwoman, chairman, which is uh, dominant, and we decided to use uh, to survive, uh, to pass this gender test and to use a gender, gender person. In the document, you will have also indica indications about the, some sort of requirements for the successful chairperson. What is needed to be, to have the, the, this delicate inter interplay between procedural role of a chairperson and substantive. Because the default is that chairperson should be a neutral, objective, uh, open for all, uh, all inputs, and this is the procedural aspect. But also the meetings and events should have some outcome, and therefore chairperson uh, uh, is supposed to influence also substantive discussion, but in very, very delicate, delicate way. That's uh, more or less the general framework for, uh, for, for discussion. Vlada, would you like to? Sushi, yes, sir. Okay. So
Okay, you have now document on the role of chairperson, position, role, and functions of the chairperson. As you can see, there is a first part discussing procedural aspect. In second part, you have substantive aspect. In third, what is needed for successful chairperson. And the last one is election of chair and how, how the negotiation starts. A procedural aspect is based on the rule 34, rules of procedure of the UN General Assembly. Uh, I always, uh, I'm Diplo is involved in training of diplomats worldwide, and the most serious diplomatic services invest a lot in training their diplomats, especially junior diplomats, in rules of procedures. It is not the most exciting topic for training. People prefer to discuss clash of civilization, geostrategical issues, and philosophy, but at the end of the day, what is bread and butter of uh, many diplomats is how to manage the rules of procedure. And uh, you can see in the UN General Assembly and the committees of the UN uh, who are the most successful countries in mastering rules of procedure. If I, my advice is uh, you're not, uh, it's not your main profession, well, for some of you it is uh, diplomatic negotiation, but whenever you go uh, for the meetings, discuss obviously what is, what is the main topic, uh, do background reading of the main issues, but also try to go through rules of procedure, especially if you are engaged in the nego negotiating processes. It is, it is vital, and uh, it will be good investment for the success of the, your success in the meeting. I highlighted here a few, uh, few elements. One is the point of order. Point of order is very often used in the international meetings and it is related to the uh, procedural issues. Uh, chairperson has to decide on point of order. It is not the most frequent request for point of order is on, uh, uh, on relevance matter. Therefore, the delegation can make a point of order if particular intervention is not of the direct relevance for the discussion of the particular meeting. For example, if the, somebody raised the hand, the, the delegation of the country, Ruristan, and start speaking um, on um, whatever, bashing the other country or uh, something which is not directly related to the uh, agenda item. Uh, then point of order is used a lot when uh, delegations want to stop or to distract discussion. Chair, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, can we use the point of order to get to ask for a vote for the votation or not? Uh, point of order you have to use only not to make a proposal. You have to react to the intervention of other delegation. Therefore, if you have inter uh, you, you take the floor and you start uh, talking on the issues uh, which are not directly to, uh, uh, to the main topic, then Jan, uh, representing the other country, can make the point of order. Chair will give the floor to Jan, and he will say, I'm sorry, 
uh, the distinguished delegate from the country uh, XY, is not following the uh, agenda item 24. Then chairperson can decide and uh, ask the, uh, the delegate to focus on the issue. Then there is a whole procedure if you can make a point of order also and arguing that you are doing, that is then moving to the procedural motion, possible voting and decision of the chair what to do next. But point of order is just alert about the intervention of the other side. Uh, voting is the procedural motion, therefore you have to make the procedural motion and to request the uh, voting on, our, on, on certain point. This is the difference. Well, the good chairperson is a manager of a conference time. Uh, th this is the crucial for the success of any human endeavor, but uh, especially important for the, nego uh, for the negotiation exercises. Because any conference has its own uh, dynamics and tempo, and chairperson has to decide when to, the, to speed up the discussion, when to slow the discussion, when to move towards the closure, uh, how to use the fact uh, of the long uh, discussions in the late in the night uh, before the midnight. And there are various tricks. One of the, one of the tricks sometimes used in mul multilateral negotiation is uh, to uh, use the fact that the translators in, uh, cannot uh, work over, the, I think, eight hours. And some delegations usually prolong the negotiation exercise in order to get the request from the translators that they cannot anymore uh, uh, translate the negotiation. Since any negotiation has to be translated in six UN languages, you have de facto blockage of the negotiation and buying the time for the consultations and maybe continuation of the negotiation tomorrow. The time element is extremely important. Or when you have a deadline, build up towards, uh, towards the closure around the deadline. And many negotiations have been uh, concluded uh, with the, by using the uh, successfully time management. Uh, then you have a substantive aspect in any negotiation uh, ex uh, ex uh, ne process. Chairperson can take more active role in influencing su substantive uh, outcome of negotiation. His or her main role is to find ways and means to overcome division and conflicting views and points. Uh, chairperson has various tools on uh, his disposal, informal talks, mediation, bilateral consultations. Now there is one important aspect here to, to raise, it is the so-called corridor diplomacy. Traditionally, you could have followed the, the dynamics of negotiations by seeing which delegation is leaving the room and who is following, and then you, you can see that there is something going on in parallel. Now the internet has changed it to the large extent, and uh, that aspect of uh, diplomatic anthropology of the conference meeting has changed substantially because you can consult easily via Skype, uh, SMS, with the uh, capitals back home. Therefore, we usually use this example as a good illustration how internet is changing the way how diplomacy is conducted. In the past, if you see country X leaving the room and country Y following after a few minutes, you can see something is going on. They are probably trying to overcome a particular tension on engaging the compromise formula. Nowadays, you, you cannot follow it easily. And this is one of the impacts of the internet on, uh, on diplomacy, which uh, we should uh, observe. Uh, you have a few examples here. We will also send you the links uh, uh, on the, um, and you can consult them on the, on the website, on our website. Position, uh, what, is the, what are the ingredients for successful chairperson? Uh, it is a uh, function of chairperson is one of the most delicate functions in diplomacy. It cannot be easily described by rules. You have rules of procedure that chairperson should follow, but do, do you have many tacit rules and uh, some sort of uh, um, um, art of the chairing the session, which you cannot uh, easily train people. You, people have to, to immerse into uh, negotiation exercises in order to acquire those skills. Some elements for the successful chair is uh, general culture, understanding on various issues, good time management skill, instinct to detect atmosphere in the room. That's, that's extremely important, that you can see through the body language, through uh, comments, through dynamics, uh, what is going in the room. Do you have a room with you? 
Is room following uh, the, the chair or uh, is it uh, splitting in various, uh, various uh, subgroups? Uh, it has to get, have a good personal rapport, good understanding of individual and collective uh, psychology, understanding of, of intercultural differences, personal qualities, good sense of humor. Humor is extremely powerful tool in uh, diplomacy. Humor can diffuse the tension. It can uh, bring people to the different, uh, in the different context where well, they may search for the compromise and uh, go beyond the their sort of uh, 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 realm. Uh, when all of these elements are put together, it makes chairperson decision made by intuition. If you make analogy to the chess grandmaster, we can see that chairperson has like grandmaster to make very often instant decisions with a thousand possible alternatives types of, uh, of position. Still, in the case of Grandmaster, final option could be calculated, Deep Blue versus Kasparov. In the case of chairperson, like other diplomats, it is not possible. It could be a reason why diplomats, diplomacy's profession is so interesting and challenging for many, including those who, fo who focus only on black limousine and receptions. But uh, we have less and less diplomats mainly seeing diplomacy through that, uh, and they are really uh, people who take responsible roles in their activities and uh, towards uh, empowering the world. Uh, I listed two extremely successful uh, chairmen. One is uh, Tommy Kov, uh, who uh, chaired the Law of the Sea negotiations, and he was the master of that time management, use of humor, use of dynamics in the room. And he managed, literally thanks to his personal skills, to overcome quite a few blockages. The other one is Mustafa Tolba, chairperson at the Barcelona uh, Convention negotiation. It is the first regional legal instrument in the Mediterranean region signed by Arab countries and uh, Israel. And Mustafa Tolba, Egyptian diplomat, was uh, very, very skillful in overcoming uh, a deep tectonic uh, uh, divides in the Mediterranean region. Those of you who are coming from the region are aware of that. Therefore, Mustafa Tolba was, is one of the examples of the highly successful negotiator. Uh, as you can see, the last point in the document is election of chair. Traditionally speaking, chair uh, was taken by a representative of the host country for a particular uh, conference meeting. It was tradition in the 19th century. And for th those of you who are interested in history, I strongly recommend to follow uh, uh, sort of um, events uh, which will celebrate 200 years of the Vienna Congress. Vienna Congress was held in uh, 1814, and uh, it is definitely one of the most successful events in the history of diplomacy. And the chairperson was uh, Austrian diplomat Metternich, who uh, organized uh, the meeting in Vienna, focusing a lot on entertainment. They had almost every evening the parties. There were excellent chefs in Vienna at that time, and uh, Austrian cuisine is excellent. And uh, he made, uh, he created general atmosphere which was uh, quite relaxing, and uh, ultimately, he succeeded in making one of the best uh, uh, diplomatic documents, which secured the general peace for almost 100 years. The, the, general peace. In the, there, were, there were no major global war in the, between 1814 and uh, 1914, before the start of the First World War. Another meeting which is completely opposite to the Vienna Congress was the uh, Versailles meeting after the First World War, where there was, uh, the organizers didn't invest into in entertainment. They invested a lot in science. They brought scientists to measure the peace and to make scientific peace. And as you know, uh, the, that piece lasted uh, for uh, less than uh, 20 years. It created uh, all uh, turmoil in, uh, in Germany and Italy and led towards the Second World War. Therefore, this is just an illustration of two important historical events, Vienna Congress from 1814 and Versailles Congress after the Second War, World War from uh, 1918, as two examples how uh, diplomacy 
should be managed in a very sensitive way, understanding dynamics, understanding the motivation of different act actors, different cultures, and uh, understanding the uh, dynamics of the moment, what is going on in the conf conference room. It makes the diplomacy extremely exciting uh, profession and it makes the role of the chairperson extremely important role in any negotiations. And uh, we will be uh, hosting two events next year discussing the comparison between Vienna Congress and the Versailles uh, Peace Treaty Conference. And I invite you to join us. We basically try to draw the lessons, what we can learn from these two historical examples. Thank you. Well, Vlada is now the chairperson. Thank you, Jovan. Um, maybe I wanted, before, before we move to the final part, which is uh, we have two colleagues from the APC to tell us about the topics of the day that will be discussed in the main sessions. Just a short question back for you. How do you see all these things that you presented in context of the IG negotiations even the IGF, because it's not a typical negotiation. So to what extent even the chairing and all these other uh, aspects are, are relevant in the context of IGF and, and IG negotiations? Uh, let me tell you one uh, anecdote from yesterday. Anecdotes are all, 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 usually old, but yesterday, and I think some of you attended this meeting. I found one room with excellent Wi-Fi connection. It's, I, I think it's around the corner, and I usually go to that room sit and do my work uh, um, preparation of documents and the workshops were going on people were um, um, and nobody noticed my presence nobody asked me to comment on anything you know uh, I, I think 50 percent of us are uh, really present when we are physically present most of us are browsing uh, the the net and doing something else and i was doing that and then uh, there was a workshop which started at four o'clock and, uh, of course, I was concentrated in drafting my documents, and then I start hearing key words, persuasion, listening, negotiation, engaging. And, you know, I tried to switch off, but the problem is a mental process. Those words started, uh, started and said, what is this workshop about? Because I didn't have a clue. I was just sitting there and doing my work on the good Wi-Fi connection. And I looked at the program of the IGF and I saw that it is the event on the internet exchange points strengthening or I don't know what was the exact title but you, you can't find a more technical topic and then I intervened and I said uh, listen this sounds you what you're discussing it sounds uh, like discussion on diplomacy and that was a really fascinating insight these people who deal with very technical issue, how to establish internet exchange point, spend most of their time negotiating with different actors, convincing different actors. And the delegate, uh, the representative from Vanuatu made a lovely, a lovely uh, um, um, uh, input by saying that he spent four years trying to convince different players in Vanuatu about the need to establish internet exchange points. And he spent 14 days, one four, to establish that exchange point technically. And it was, it was really, really a fascinating uh, insight for me. Therefore, that explains uh, and answers your question. I think even when we are dealing with technical issues, we are dealing with uh, human dynamics. And uh, that's, uh, in a way, <laughs> this is diplomacy and uh, quite, quite substantive diplomacy. And uh, I ended the session yesterday, my intervention, to them with calling them uh, your excellencies, but in the genuine term of excellencies, not just the protocol, because they were doing diplomacy uh, in, the, in the most effective way. Hi, uh, just to follow up on, um, on Vlade's question, and uh, I recognize what you're saying, that it happens in your ordinary day-to-day -day situations, negotiating IXPs, that sort of thing. But um, if I take Vlada's question and take it to something like the Rio Declaration. Sala, we, we need to strengthen the voices of the small Pacific Island states. <laughs> Louder. Is that loud enough? I'm loud in my own ears. Anyway, sorry. Apologies. Um, 
Yes, so I was wanting to take uh, Vlada's question a step further and uh, take it to uh, declaration level or in terms of potential instruments, whether it's declaration or convention or treaty. Uh, in the context of internet governance, the question I have is, how would uh, a chairperson deal with situations where uh, negotiation on text, whilst it may be something simple like a declaration, but concerns multiple uh, potentially treaties that, you know, because you, you mentioned in terms of the different baskets, like uh, the strength, the, one of the baskets is strengthening existing mechanisms. And so what happens when you have instances where certain aspects of internet governance is, ca is canvassed under WIPO or, and other, in, uh, other aspects are canvassed under WTO and other things under ITU, other things under different things. And so as in terms of the negotiation of the text, how would you uh, set the context or, or narrow it or should you narrow it or not? Or is, is, is it something left to players around the table? So question for you. Uh, Sala, concretely speaking, in this simulation exercise on the Rio Declaration, it is rather genera generic document establishing principles. I don't expect that, uh, for example, next meeting will we'll deal with specific aspects of intellectual property rights or e-commerce, which you mentioned the question of the WIPO and the WTO. Sorry, just to follow through? Please, go ahead. Just to follow through. In terms of the 87 nations that just signed the framework in Seoul, uh, where, they, uh, where the 87 governments are agreeing that there needs to be greater enhanced cooperation in terms of cybersecurity and th things like that. And then pertaining to um, issues of, you know, uh, what are the forms of cooperation or what actually do the players or governments like Brazil, what are they looking for? So the question I have is, even in terms of setting a simple thing like a framework, a declaration, what is it really? Is it going what to, is it? What is it really? Is it a thematic? And you've mentioned that it's not going to be on thematics, but it's going to. So, so I'm kind of. I guess what I'm asking you is how how do you think it's going to play out, or how would a chair deal with something that has so many variables, oh. and uh, to establish a simple thing like a declaration? I apologize that that's a really dumb question. It, it, is, it is a tough question. I'm sure that, uh, that our Brazilian colleagues will spend quite some time before the Rio meeting, uh, Rio uh, conference, engaging with different actors and uh, trying to see uh, how, how it could be done. I w one can use the, the metaphor of the, of the cameras, these sophisticated cameras with zoom in, zoom out. This is one possible metaphor. And most likely this type of document will be uh, zoom out. Uh, the risk is that it can, they, they go for the, the least common denominator, therefore the, the, the regulation could be watered down, although not necessarily. There are examples from recent history, from uh, 1972 and Stockholm Declaration on the Sustainable Development, which, uh, which was one of the very substantive soft law documents. And when you zoom in, you usually go into the more specific uh, and uh, legal uh, obligations and more precise drafting. Uh, that's, that's the general principle. But it is a difficult exercise to find umbrella document for internet governance. And is there a need to have umbrella document? It is also another question uh, that's, that should be, should, be, should be answered. Now, one possibility, one, another metaphor that one can consider and uh, is that uh, for example, IGF, where we are meeting uh, these days, will be some sort of the waiter in the prestigious global uh, uh, internet governance restaurant, receiving the orders from the clients, from the guests, who are the stakeholders, governments, private sector, and then passing that uh, orders to the kitchen, and kitchen uh, could be the organizations, international organizations, but also private, non-governmental, who are dealing with specific issues. Therefore, we would collect the orders uh, in the Internet Governance Forum and pass to the organizations like um, um, ITU, WIPO, or the private uh, standardization organization to follow up on the, on the specific issue that global Internet Governance community identified as important uh, 
issue for the future uh, f for the for the future of the internet that could be one of the one of the possible metaphors uh, restaurant metaphor uh, if i can can uh, can use and that uh, could provide flexibility of not having to engage into very detailed negotiations and but in the same time providing the space for the organization specialized in specific field to act and to adopt the necessary documents when it comes to the global document, uh, one cannot, I think it's very difficult to imagine what's happened in the law of the sea, drafting of the, some sort of law of the internet and the uh, uh, global convention. The law of the sea convention was drafted for 10 years. And in the time of the internet, that would be, that would be rather, rather a long period. But it doesn't mean that we, uh, we cannot have the customer international law and some sort of codification of existing rules which are now emerging, how the states and different players are using the internet. Therefore, that the question of the different legal techniques, international legal techniques, is important and should be, should be used with necessary flexibility. Thank you, Jovan. Um, if no further questions about negotiations, any other questions, or should we end up this part with the, with the last part, which is um, what are the topics of the day today? So today there are main, two main sessions uh, which are following in this, in this main room. And one of them is an openness, human rights, freedom of expression, free flow of information on the internet. And the other one is about access and diversity, internet as an engine for growth and sustainable development. Now with us we have two colleagues from the APC, Shauna and Mike, who are not directly involved in the two set sessions but are definitely involved in the, in the these thematic areas. So maybe briefly just to, to hear from you what, what are those topics that are likely to be touched upon during the, the, uh, today's um, main sessions. Shauna, you want to start? Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, um, the main session that's happening this afternoon starting at 2.30 um, focuses on openness, human rights, freedom of expression, and the free flow of information on the internet. Um, so this is the first time that there will be a focus session specifically on human rights, um, which I think is quite important, particularly in light of the recent revelations around mass surveillance. So last year in June 2012, the Human Rights Council adopted a milestone resolution in which governments agreed that the same human rights that apply offline also apply online. So some of the things that this main session will be considering this afternoon are what is this resolution, um, how is it relevant to internet public policy making, and what is the impact of mass surveillance on taking this resolution forward. And some of the key issues that will be discussed are internet intermediary liability. So what is the role of um, online intermediaries, including ISPs, including uh, companies, in upholding human rights? Um, there will also be a focus on sexual rights and the impact of the internet on women's rights, LGBT rights. There will be a focus as well on freedom of expression um, and surveillance, as well as privacy and um, as well as ne net neutrality issues and access to knowledge and internet um, policy issues quite broadly. Um, so it'll be quite a dynamic and open session and I think it'll be quite important considering this is the first time that human rights are um, in the focus session. Uh, thank you, Vlad. Um, in terms of the issues around uh, the internet as, uh, and the access issues, um, I think it's quite appropriate to follow on from the human rights session as uh, I think it's being increasingly understood that uh, access to the internet enables a lot of human rights. Uh, one needs to make the distinction that access itself is not a human right except uh, defined by Finland so far but it does enable the achievement of many other human rights 
Um, in terms of it being a, a vehicle for growth and sustainability, I think it is now fairly well recognized how important it is for achieving increased uh, social inclusion uh, and increased economic growth through uh, improving the access to markets for farmers, for example, through improving educational levels in uh, areas where there are low levels of resources for teaching, uh, for improving the health of, of uh, populations through access to telemedicine, for example. Now, in this respect, access is a public good. And uh, we are still in a situation, it's been discussed in a couple of panels yesterday, that uh, we have not yet, despite almost 15 years of intention, achieved uh, sufficient levels of, of access to the internet in developing countries in particular, but also in certain sectors of, of societies in developed countries. Uh, this is particularly the case in rural areas uh, and in various disenfranchised groups. Uh, this ranges from women to um, uh, threatened ethnic populations to uh, senior citizens, institutionalized people, and the disabled. So there's a long way to go in terms of ensuring that we have this uh, in global inclusion of all of these groups. And uh, there was general recognition amongst the panels that uh, there cannot be really a universally um, accepted objective for the degree of, uh, of inclusion in terms of Internet access, but that each country and each region needs to make its own um, set its own standards in terms of affordability, in terms of uptake and penetration, and in terms of reliability. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sorry for cutting, but we're up to the time, and the uh, next panel is ready. Thank you all for coming uh, today, and join us tomorrow for the orientation session. We'll go through the, what's happening between the two IGFs and how to stay involved. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to... Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Nous allons commencer nos travaux. Notre première session thématique de ce matin. Donc, merci de regagner vos sièges. Sorry.